Hi, I'm Amalia Skilton. I'm a postdoc in linguistics at UT Austin, and I'm going to be speaking today about documentation of child language. I want to begin by acknowledging that I am coming to you from Austin, Texas, and Austin is part of the traditional land of Tonakawa, Lipan Apache, Comanche, and other indigenous people. Um, I also want to note that because I am being impacted by the winter storm here in Austin, Texas, I am not able to show you my face. I apologize for that. I want to begin by asking a very broad question. Why study child language in documentation? To me, there are three reasons. First, this work is important to language reclamation. Language reclamation practitioners have said that developmental research is helpful for them to design curriculum, to create assessments for kids, and to create evaluations for programs that deliver language teaching to young children, such as language nests and immersion schools. You can read more about this in this report from the Office of Head Start that I've cited here. And to me, supporting language reclamation is the most important reason to do this work. Second, this is also important to academic first language acquisition research. As Clifton Pye has argued, for decades, first language acquisition researchers have mostly ignored indigenous people and indigenous languages. And that means that we don't know much about how first language acquisition happens in indigenous social settings or how it works for the grammatical features of indigenous languages. So we also need to do this research from the general first language acquisition perspective. And last, it's important to document child language so that we can create complete language documentation. When a language is being learned intergenerationally, a lot of the use of that language is coming from kids or being directed to kids. And when we don't document that, we're ignoring an important way of speaking. And this is coming from Lenore Grenoble in her 2015 plenary to the ICLDC. We have to document the uh-oh spaghettios kind of language people direct toward kids in order to be documenting the language as a whole. But even though we have these strong motivations to do child language documentation, often those studies don't happen. And I think that one reason for that, among others, is that we lack established methods. Documentation methods that are designed for adults, such as conducting interviews or recording texts, are often inappropriate for kids for developmental reasons. Conversely, First language acquisition methods that are used in the lab in Western settings are often inappropriate in documentation or indigenous contexts because they are culturally inappropriate. So with that in mind, my goal in this talk is to share example methods that have worked for me to study child language in an indigenous social setting as an outsider. These methods have worked for me individually. I don't want that they're going to work for everyone. My goal here is to present a case study and begin a conversation. I'm going to be speaking today about work with the Takuna language and the people who speak it, Takuna people. Takuna is a language isolate. It is spoken along the Amazon River, which is shown in yellow on this map. The Takuna territory on the Amazon River is shown in yellow. Um, it's spoken in Brazil, Western Brazil right here, Southern Colombia, and the north, this Northeastern tip of Peru. Depending on what source you consult, there are between 40,000 and 70,000 speakers. And that makes Tacuna the most widely spoken indigenous language of Brazil and one of the more widely spoken languages of the Amazon basin. There is quite a bit of documentation of Tacuna and I've cited some of the more important works here, um, but I'm not going to engage with them in this talk because they are not about child language. My relationship with Takuna speakers is that I've been conducting field work in one Takuna community over about 13 months um, since 2015. That has included around 11 months um, of work in general documentation with adults, as well as theoretical work and pragmatics during that time, um, as well as two and a half-ish months exclusively working with kids on topics in first language acquisition. All of my research with Takuna speakers has taken place in the same place, and that is the town of Cuxiococha, Peru, which is the western extreme of Takuna territory. Cuxiococha is a titled indigenous community with around 5,000 people, and most people there are ethnically Takuna and speak Takuna as their first and dominant language. Many people are also bilingual or trilingual in Spanish and Portuguese, um, but really the language that you most often hear in this community is Takuna.
So I want to introduce you to the study that I conducted at first language acquisition in this setting by giving you an overview of the design and the participant structure. In general, child language studies have either a longitudinal or a cross-sectional design. In a longitudinal design, the researchers recruit a small group of kids and they follow those kids for several months or up to a few years, recording them at short intervals. Two examples of longitudinal studies are Catherine DeMuth and colleagues' work on the Providence Corpus of English, that's the DeMuth et al. citation here, and Pedro Mateo Pedro's work on the acquisition of the Mayan language, Ganjobal. In studies like this, so in the DeMuth study, they recorded six children for one hour every two weeks for two full years who were learning English. And in Pedro Mateo Pedro's study, he recorded three children who were learning Kanjobal every two weeks for six months. So longitudinal studies like this are seen as the gold standard because they allow you to directly observe developmental changes in each child as they are happening. However, they also require a very long-term engagement with the kids in order to collect the data over time. The main alternative to a longitudinal design is a cross-sectional design where the researchers enroll many children of different ages and they record each child just once instead of following them. And then in order to determine how development is working, you make comparisons between different age groups. And from those age group differences, you infer the timing of developmental changes. So instead of following one child from age two to age three, you could record a two-year-old and record a three-year-old, compare the two of them, and infer from the differences between the two kids what is happening developmentally between two and three. These kinds of methodologies are also used for both studies of English and for studies of indigenous languages. The Bergelson et al. paper here is a study about English in the US and Canada, and the Casillas et al. paper is a study about the Mayan language Seltzal, using exactly the same cross-sectional methodology here. So longitudinal and cross-sectional designs are both options for studies of indigenous languages. In my particular case, lo a longitudinal design was not possible for me for reasons of time frame. I do not live full-time in Kushiokocha, and because of the length of the grant that I received to do this work, I was not able to spend six to 12 months there in order to collect the data. And so simply for logistical reasons, I had to use a cross-sectional design. And Nolata Chi, in her work on the acquisition of Diné, points out that field workers will often be forced for logistical reasons to use cross-sectional designs. In my cross-sectional design, I targeted kids who were within the phase of primary first language acquisition, meaning from about exactly one year old, 12 months one day, to a little under five years old, so four years, 11 months. I recruited 45 children, um, and that, those consisted of 14 one-year-olds, and then the other age bins, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, each had 10 or 11 children each. And the way that I recruited the 45 children was that I began with the kids of people who had already worked with me in previous years as language consultants. And then I used a snowball methodology. So I started off by recording the kids of my existing consultants. Then I asked the consultants, who else might be interested in this? And they might say, you know, my sister or my neighbor. I go to the sister or neighbor. I say, do you want to do this? They say, yes, I record them. And then I ask them, who can you refer? And so that was how I was able to iterate out the recruitment and recruit and record a total of 45 kids over about 10 weeks. Most indigenous language studies are not able to include 45 people, even if they have a large speaker population to work with. And so I want to reflect on why I was able to achieve this sample size. I think one consideration is that I had a large network of contacts in Kushiokocha. I had already been living in Kushiokocha for about 11 total months um, when I began doing the recruitment for this study. So I had met a lot of people over that time. And I had also used some research methodologies in the past, like recording conversations in people's homes, that tended to introduce me to a lot of people. And so I had solid working relationships with around 40 or 50 adults when I began doing this work, and that absolutely facilitated recruitment. Another thing that helped with recruitment was that many people who had, who had already worked with these language consultants had young children. 
And so there was not a need to be referred to me in order to meet the first participants. Instead, I had already met those participants because they were children of people who had already worked with me. I had encountered them in their homes and they knew me already. And then last, but I think the most important consideration here is that during the time of this study, almost all kids in Kushiokocha were learning Takuna. And so I did not need to screen for whether children were speakers before reporting them. I simply assumed that they were speakers until suggested otherwise, and that was almost always correct. So I've mentioned that I recorded 45 children, but what did I record them doing? In traditional first language acquisition studies, one of the key methodologies is that researchers record children doing their everyday activities, just interacting with caregivers and family members at home or at a school or daycare if that's appropriate. Sometimes people will also record care, um, children and caregivers interacting in a lab. There are additional and alternative methods out there in child language research. People can do surveys with caregivers, ask them what they think their kids know. They can do experiments with kids. They can prompt kids to tell stories and so on. However, in this research, I chose to focus exclusively on collecting recordings of everyday life. And that was for two reasons. First, I felt that recordings of everyday life were more likely to succeed than other methodologies like experiments because they don't require piloting. Experiments need to be piloted and they can fail. So I thought that they weren't a great use of limited field work time. The other reason that I decided to focus on this was that I was concerned that other methodologies might not be credible to participants. For example, participants might not think that experiments were a legitimate thing for children to do, or they might not view the experiment as a legitimate methodology to find out about language. And that was based on some previous experiences I had had. And so in order to be friendly to participants and also in order to be consistent with their views about language, I chose to focus just on recordings of everyday life. Each child participated in three different data collection tasks. First, each child participated in a day-long audio recording where they were recorded on a body-worn audio recording device for an entire day from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. The recorders recorded everything that they heard and said over that entire nine hour day. These recordings are of course extremely natural. Um, they're just capturing what the child is doing and saying on an ordinary day, but they are also very hard to analyze. So we didn't want them to be the only source of data in this study. Therefore, after the day long audio recording, each child and caregiver participated in a 30 minute object play video. And in this video, the child and one of their caregivers played with an object that I provided in their home, and they were recorded with two video cameras and also with body-worn audio devices. The object was a set of marbles because that is a toy that is common in this community for kids. The purpose of this data was to generate something that was maximally comparable and that could be compared between different participants to facilitate developmental analysis. We didn't want to have only purely naturalistic data because people do very different things in, how, in the most naturalistic data. And so it can be hard to compare, for example, kids' vocabularies. Um, but when it came to this object play, we knew it would be comparable because kids were all doing the same thing and talking about the same topic. Following the object play video, each child and caregiver also participated in a 60 minute free play video. And in this, the child and caregiver just did whatever they wanted in their home for 60 minutes. And they were recorded with dual camera video and body worn audio devices again. And during this video, they were told that they could really do whatever they liked, as long as they remained in the same room where the cameras had been set up. I was not present. I was present for the object play video to operate the cameras, but for free play video, I set up the cameras and then left. And so this data is very natural. Um, people are doing their everyday activities, um, but it's not necessarily very comparable between participants because, for example, they do different things, they talk about different topics, and so they're engaged in different ways of speaking. Here's an example of what this data looks like. You can see on the left one video stream, you can see on the right a second video stream coming from a different angle. This is from the video camera visible at left here. The participants are both wearing audio devices on their bodies to give us a nice close up audio track that's easy to transcribe. The woman's and the caregiver's audio recording devices here. And this is a recording of free play. The child and caregiver are playing with a set of toys that belong to them 
These are not toys that I provided. I want to reflect somewhat on the roots of these tasks. I think that one important thing that informed these tasks is that in Takuna culture, at least in Kushiokocha, one-on-one -on -one child caregiver interactions are commonplace. That is not the case everywhere in the world. There are some settings worldwide where multi-party interactions, so multiple kids, multiple caregivers, are much more common. If you're operating in a setting like that, that's what you want to record. Don't try to go one-on-one -on -one because people will be uncomfortable. I think another root of this task is that in Takuna culture, again, at least in Kushiokocha, it's common for adult caregivers to talk directly to kids, including very young kids. So like newborns less than one month old, I have recorded adults talking to them using ordinary language, not only baby talk. And that is not true, again, everywhere in the world. There are some places where caregivers don't talk directly to kids, but instead prefer to talk to a lower status caregiver who then talk to the child. That's what Eleanor Oaks has described in Samoa. Or where caregivers mostly talk to other adults and then kids learn primarily from overheard speech. If you're operating in a setting like that, this kind of one-on-one -on -one task will not work because adults simply won't talk. You would wanna include a second caregiver so in order to ensure that you actually get speech. But they happen to work for me. So I collected a large volume of data. How did I possibly transcribe all of that? There are really three ways that people approach transcription for studies of this kind of volume. One, some people choose not to sample their data and simply transcribe everything. That requires a big research team and usually also a longitudinal design so that you can transcribe data gradually over months to years as it comes in. Another option people take is to not transcribe and instead analyze data using automated protocols like the Lena protocol from Greenwood. Those kind of protocols take recordings and produce things like word counts and turn counts, but they can't produce any more granular information like counts of specific word types. And they also have not been validated for any indigenous language. So if you don't, if you want to transcribe, but you can't transcribe everything given your resources, then what you need to do is to sample the recordings, choose some sub part of what you've collected and transcribe just that. People have developed a range of approaches to sampling, including random sampling, true, true random number generation, timestamp based sampling. So you sample every 10th minute or you sample the 19th minute of every hour or sampling based on information density. So for example, um, sampling the parts of the recording that have the highest density of, of frequencies characteristic of human speech. In this particular research, we chose to use a combination of timestamp based and information density based sampling. For the object play, we used timestamp based sampling and simply transcribed the first 10 minutes of every recording. That was very low effort. It wasn't hard to identify the first 10 minutes, of course. And they also weren't hard to transcribe um, because these recordings are very repetitive. People are all talking about the same thing, which is the activity of playing marbles. In the free play recordings, um, we chose to use a density-based approach where we transcribed the 10 minutes that had the greatest proportion of child speech and child-directed speech. And that was identified in most cases automatically using pitch criteria. This did require much more effort to identify the high child speech density segment and to transcribe that, se that segment because since this was undirected activity and um, people talked about a much wider range of topics than an object play. And so the content of what they were saying was not as predictable. However, that effort was rewarded because these recordings are very informative. People talk about a lot of different topics. They use a lot of different types of constructions and vocabulary as both adults and kids. And so I think that effort was rewarded. The choice to transcribe just 10 minutes was not without problems. Since we're transcribing um, the 10 minutes that have the most speech, that's often late in the recording. So we're diving into an ongoing interaction without much context about what's happened before. And that does mean that we're some, we were sometimes confused while working on these transcriptions um, because we didn't have context from earlier parts of the interaction. And as for the day long recordings, they simply haven't been sampled or transcribed yet. I want to reflect on what drove these choices about transcription. The object play data, we chose to use timestamp based sampling as to the first 10 minutes because it's very similar over time 
and it's very similar between participants. So we could have chosen to transcribe on a timestamp based model or a random model and the outcome would have been about the same because this is really uniform. On the other hand, the free play recordings are very different because they don't have a constant amount of talk over time. Instead, they have long silences followed by short bursts of talk like most recordings of interaction. And those short bursts of talk are at different times for every participant. So if we had used timestamp-based sampling or random sampling, we would have transcribed a lot of silence. And for that reason, we chose to use density-based sampling instead so that we were actually transcribing speech and not silence um, when we were working with transcribers. The day-long recordings, we haven't transcribed these because they're not a priority for us right now. Other recordings that have video are just easier to transcribe and analyze. And so um, these have been left as a lower priority because they are going to require a lot more effort in order to get information. So I wanna offer a few concluding thoughts. I want to really take away from this talk that lab methods and field methods are not the same. We do not want to import the methods used in first language acquisition labs into indigenous settings. Many of those methods are really bound to Western cultures and are inappropriate elsewhere. An example of this, in my opinion, is caregiver surveys. They make a lot of assumptions about how caregiving works and what caregivers believe about kids, and they are not appropriate um, without a great deal of modification to use in an indigenous or documentation context. So we want to be very critical about what we use from the lab. Instead of importing things from the lab, I think we want to work with and recognize what is already there in documentation context in indigenous communities. And that is child caregiver interaction. And child caregiver interaction is a wonderful thing to study. It's extremely natural. It has to happen as part of everyday life. It's extremely comparable between participants. Everyone receives caregiving. And between societies, everyone gives caregiving. Adults worldwide do this. And it's also extremely rich for linguistic analysis because the things that adults say and the things that children say um, in child caregiver interaction are as complex as in any other form of everyday interaction. So this material is both linguistically valuable and also essential for developmental analysis. Finally, I wanna reflect somewhat on the broader impacts of this work. By studying child language in documentation in indigenous settings, we can create knowledge about child development that can inform language reclamation and conservation. We can also, by doing this work, create a more holistic picture of language use. And by doing that, we can create more complete language documentation. We're not simply going to be documenting how adults speak to other adults, but how people speak to other people, both adults and children. And last, this work can also produce a very rich source of adult speech. People may see child-directed speech as simplified, but it's not always. And so there can be the same kind of cycle between documentation and language description for child language research as there is for more traditional documentary research with adults. You can get very valuable examples for adult language description from this work. That's all I have to say. So I wanna thank you for watching my talk the families and participants in this research, my Takuna collaborator, Angel Vito Corsera, mentors and colleagues who have seen versions of this talk, and my funders. And you can see more of my work at my website, including um, a copy of these slides with the references.